Chapter forty five of Lorna Doone. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Lorna Doone by R. D. Blackmore. Chapter forty five. A change long needed. Jeremy Stickles was gone south ere ever the frost set in for the purpose of mustering forces to attack the Doone Glen. But now this weather had put a stop to every kind of movement for even if men could have borne the cold, they could scarcely be brought to face the perils of the snowdrifts. And to tell the truth, I cared not how long this weather lasted, so long as we had enough to eat and could keep ourselves from freezing. Not only that I did not want Master Stickles back again to make more disturbances, but also that the dunes could not come prowling after Lorna while the snow lay piled between us with the surface soft and dry. Of course, they would very soon discover where their lawful queen was, although the track of sled and snowshoes had been quite obliterated by another shower before the revellers could have grown half as drunk as they intended. But Marwood de Wickerhauser, who had been snowed up among them, as Gwenny said, after helping to strip the beacon, that young squire was almost certain to have recognised me and to have told vile Carver. And it gave me no little pleasure to think how mad that Carver must be with me for robbing him of the lovely bride whom he was starving into matrimony. However, I was not pleased at all with the prospect of the consequences, but set all hands on to thresh the corn, ere the dunes could come and burn the ricks, for I knew that they could not come yet, inasmuch as even a forest pony could not traverse the country, much less the heavy horses needed to carry such men as they were. And hundreds of the forest ponies died in this hard weather, some being buried in the snow, and more of them starved for want of grass. Going through this state of things, and laying down the law about it, subject to correction. I very soon persuaded Lorna that for the present she was safe, and, which made her still more happy, that she was not only welcome, but as gladdening to our eyes as the flowers of May. Truly, so far as regarded myself, this was not a hundredth part of the real truth, and even as regarded others I might have said it ten times over. For Lorna had so won them all by her kind and gentle ways, and her mode of hearkening to everybody's trouble, and replying without words, as well as by her beauty and simple grace of all things, that I could almost wish sometimes the rest would leave her more to me. But mother could not do enough, and any almost worshipped her, and even Lizzie could not keep her bitterness towards her, especially when she found that Lorna knew as much of books as need be. As for John Fry and Betty and Molly, they were a perfect plague when Lorna came into the kitchen, for betwixt their curiosity to see a live dune in the flesh, when certain not to eat them, and their high respect for birth, with or without honesty, and their intense desire to know all about Master John's sweetheart, dropped, as they said, from the snow-clouds, and most of all, their admiration of a beauty such as never even their angels could have seen. Betwixt and between all this, I say, there was no getting the dinner cooked with Lorna in the kitchen. And the worst of it was that Lorna took the strangest of all strange fancies for this very kitchen, and it was hard to keep her out of it. Not that she had any special bent for cooking, as our Annie had, rather indeed the contrary, for she liked to have her food ready cooked, but that she loved the look of the place, and the cheerful fire burning, and the racks of bacon to be seen, and the richness, and the homeliness, and the pleasant smell of everything. And who knows but what she may have liked, as the very best of maidens do, to be admired now and then, between the times of business. Therefore, if you wanted Lorna, as I was always sure to do God knows how many times a day, the very surest place to find her was our own old kitchen. Not gossiping, I mean, nor loitering, neither seeking into things, but seeming to be quite at home as if she had known it from a child, and seeming, to my eyes at least, to light it up and make life and colour out of all the dullness, as I have seen the breaking sun do among brown shocks of wheat. But any one who wished to learn whether girls can change or not as the things around them change, while yet their hearts are steadfast and for ever anchored, he should just have seen my Lorna, after a fortnight of our life and freedom from anxiety. It is possible that my company, although I am accounted stupid by folk who do not know my way, may have had something to do with it, but upon this I will not say much, lest I lose my character. And indeed, as regards company, I had all the threshing to see to, and more than half to do myself, though any stranger would have thought that even John Fry must work hard this weather else I could not hope at all to get our corn into such compass that a good gun might protect it. But to come back to Lorna again, which I always long to do and must long for ever, all the change between night and day, 
all the shifts of cloud and sun, all the difference between black death and brightsome liveliness, scarcely may suggest or equal Lorna's transformation. Quick she had always been, and pert, as we say on Exmoor, and gifted with a leap of thought too swift for me to follow, and hence you may find fault with much when I report her sayings. But through the whole had always run, as a black string goes through pearls, something dark and touched with shadow, coloured as with an early end. But now, behold, there was none of this. There was no getting her, for a moment even, to be serious. All her bright young wit was flashing like a newly awakened flame, and all her high young spirits leaped as if dancing to its fire and yet she never spoke a word which gave more pain than pleasure. And even in her outward look there was much of difference. Whether it was our warmth and freedom, and our harmless love of God and trust in one another, or whether it were our air and water and the pea-fed bacon, anyhow, my Lorna grew richer and more lovely, more perfect and more firm of figure, and more light and buoyant with every passing day that laid its tribute on her cheeks and lips. I was allowed one kiss a day, only one for Mena's sake, because she was our visitor, and I might have it before breakfast, or else when I came to say good-night, according as I decided. And I decided every night not to take it in the morning, but put it off till the evening time, and have the pleasure to think about through all the day of working. But when my darling came up to me in the early daylight, fresher than the day-star, and with no one looking, only her bright eyes smiling and sweet lips quite ready, was it likely I could wait and think all day about it? for she wore a frock of Annie's, nicely made to fit her, taken in at the waist, and curved, I never could explain it, not being a mantua maker, but I know how her figure looked in it, and how it came towards me. But this is neither here nor there, and I must on with my story. Those days are very sacred to me, and if I speak lightly of them, trust me, tis with lip alone, while from heart, reproach peeps sadly at the flippant tricks of mind. Although it was the longest winter ever known in our parts, never having ceased to freeze for a single night, and scarcely for a single day, from the middle of December till the second week in March, to me it was the very shortest and the most delicious, and verily I do believe it was the same to Lorna. But when the Ides of March were come, of which I do remember something dim from school, and something clear from my favourite writer, lo, there were increasing signals of a change of weather one leading feature of that long cold, and a thing remarked by every one, however unobservant, had been the hollow moaning sound ever present in the air, morning, noon, and night-time, and especially at night, whether any wind were stirring, or whether it were a perfect calm. Our people said that it was a witch, cursing all the country from the caverns by the sea, and that frost and snow would last until we could catch and drown her. But the land being thoroughly blocked with snow, and the inshore parts of the sea with ice floating in great fields along, Mother Meldrum, if she it were, had the caverns all to herself, for there was no getting at her. And speaking of the sea reminds me of a thing reported to us, and on good authority, though people might be found hereafter who would not believe it, unless I told them that, from what I myself beheld of the channel, I place perfect faith in it. And this is, that a dozen sailors at the beginning of March crossed the ice with the aid of poles, from Cleveden to Penarth, or where the Holm rocks barred the floatage. But now, about the tenth of March, that miserable moaning noise, which had both foregone and accompanied the rigour, died away from out the air, and we, being now so used to it, thought at first that we must be deaf, and then the fog which had hung about even in full sunshine vanished, and the shrouded hills shone forth with brightness manifold. And now the sky at length began to come to its true manner, which we had not seen for months, a mixture, if I so may speak, of various expressions. Whereas till now from all hallows tide, six weeks ere the great frost set in, the heavens had worn one heavy mask of ashen grey when clouded, or else one amethystine tinge with a hazy rim when cloudless. So it was pleasant to behold, after that monotony, the fickle sky which suits our England, though abused by foreign folk. And soon the dappled softening sky gave some earnest of its mood, for a brisk south wind arose, and the blessed rain came driving, cold indeed, yet most refreshing to the skin, all parched with snow, and the eyeballs so long dazzled. Neither was the heart more sluggish in its thankfulness to God. People had begun to think, and somebody had prophesied, that we should have no spring this year, no seed-time, and no harvest, for that the Lord had sent a judgment on this country of England, and the nation dwelling in it, 
because of the wickedness of the court and the encouragement shown to papists. And this was proved, they said, by what had happened in the town of London, where, for more than a fortnight, such a chill of darkness lay, that no man might behold his neighbour, even across the narrowest street, and where the ice upon the Thames was more than four feet thick and crushing London Bridge in twain. Now to these prophets I paid no heed, believing not that Providence would freeze us for other people's sins, neither seeing how England could, for many generations, have enjoyed good sunshine, if popery meant frosts and fogs. Besides, why could not Providence settle the business once for all by freezing the Pope himself, even though, according to our view, he were destined to extremes of heat, together with all who followed him? Not to meddle with that subject, being beyond my judgment, let me tell the things I saw, and then you must believe me. The wind, of course, I could not see, not having the powers of a pig, but I could see the laden branches of the great oaks moving, hoping to shake off the load packed and saddled on them, and hereby I may note a thing which someone may explain perhaps in the after-ages, when people come to look at things. This is, that in desperate cold all the trees are pulled awry, even though the wind has scattered the snow burden from them. Of some sorts the branches bended downwards like an archway, of other sorts the boughs curved upwards like a red deer's frontlet. This I know no reason for, but am ready to swear that I saw it. Now when the first of the rain began, and the old familiar softness spread upon the window-glass, and ran a little way in channels, though from the coldness of the glass it froze before reaching the bottom, knowing at once the difference from the short, sharp thud of snow, we all ran out and filled our eyes and filled our hearts with gazing. True, the snow was piled up now, all in mountains round us. True, the air was still so cold that our breath froze on the doorway, and the rain was turned to ice wherever it struck anything. Nevertheless, that it was rain, there was no denying, as we watched it across black doorways, and could see no sign of white. Mother, who had made up her mind that the farm was not worth having after all those prophecies, and that all of us must starve, and holes be scratched in the snow for us, and no use to put up a tombstone, for our church had been shut up long ago, Mother fell upon my breast and sobbed that I was the cleverest fellow ever born of woman. And this because I had condemned the prophets for a pack of fools, not seeing how business could go on if people stopped to hearken to them. Then Lorna came and glorified me, for I had predicted a change of weather, more to keep their spirits up than with real hope of it. And then came Annie, blushing shyly, as I looked at her, and told her that Winnie would soon have four legs now. This referred to some stupid joke made by John Fry or somebody, that in this weather a man had no legs and a horse had only two. But as the rain came down upon us from the south-west wind, and we could not have enough of it, even putting our tongues to catch it as little children might do, and beginning to talk of primroses. The very noblest thing of all was to hear and see the gratitude of the poor beasts yet remaining, and the few surviving birds. From the cow-house lowing came, more than of fifty milking times, moo and moo, and a turn-up noise at the end of every bellow, as if from the very heart of kine. Then the horses in the stables, packed as closely as they could stick at the risk of kicking, to keep the warmth in one another, and their spirits up by discoursing. These began with one accord to lift up their voices, snorting, snaffling, whinnying, and neighing, and trotting to the door to know when they should have work again. To whom, as if in answer, came the feeble bleating of the sheep, what few by dint of greatest care had kept their fleeces on their backs and their four legs under them. Neither was it a trifling thing, let whoso will say the contrary, to behold the ducks and geese marching forth in handsome order from their beds of fern and straw. What a goodly noise they kept, what a flapping of their wings and a jerking of their tails, as they stood right up and tried with a whistling in their throats to imitate a cockscrow. And then how daintily they took the wet upon their dusty plumes, and ducked their shoulders to it, and began to dress themselves, and laid their grooved bills on the snow, and dabbled for more ooziness. Lorna had never seen, I dare say, anything like this before, and it was all that we could do to keep her from rushing forth, with only the little lambswool shoes on, and kissing every one of them. "'Oh, the dear things! Oh, the dear things!' she kept saying continually. "'How wonderfully clever they are! Only look at that one with his foot up, giving orders to the others, John!' "'And I must give orders to you, my darling,' I answered, gazing on her face so brilliant with excitement and that is that you come in at once with that worrisome cough of yours, and sit by the fire and warm yourself. Oh, no, John, not for a minute, if you please, good John. I want to see the snow go away, and the green meadows coming forth. 
and here comes our favourite robin who has lived in the oven so long and sung us a song every morning i must see what he thinks of it you will do nothing of the sort i answered very shortly being only too glad of a cause for having her in my arms again so i caught her up and carried her in and she looked and smiled so sweetly at me instead of pouting as i had feared that i found myself unable to go very fast along the passage and i set her there in her favourite place by the sweet-scented wood-fire and she paid me porterage without my even asking her and for all the beauty of the rain i was fain to stay with her until our any came to say that my advice was wanted now my advice was never much as everybody knew quite well but that was the way they always put it when they wanted me to work for them and in truth it was time for me to work not for others but myself and as i always thought for lorna for the rain was now coming down in earnest and the top of the snow being frozen at last and glazed as hard as china cup by means of the sun and frost afterwards all the rain ran right away from the steep inclines and all the outlets being blocked with ice set up like tables it threatened to flood everything already it was ponding up like a tide advancing at the threshold of the door from which we had watched the duck birds both because great piles of snow trended in that direction in spite of all our scraping and also that the gully hole where the water of the chute went out i mean when it was water now was choked with lumps of ice as big as a man's body for the chute as we called our little runnel of everlasting water never known to freeze before and always ready for any man either to wash his hands or drink where it spouted from a trough of bark set among the white flint stones this at last had given in and its music ceased to lull us as we lay in bed it was not long before i managed to drain off this threatening flood by opening the old sluice hole but i had much harder work to keep the stables and the cow-house and the other sheds from flooding for we have a sapient practice and i never saw the contrary round about our parts i mean of keeping all rooms underground so that you step down to them we say that thus we keep them warmer both for cattle and for men in the time of winter and cooler in the summer time this i will not contradict though having my own opinion but it seems to me to be a relic of the time when people in the western countries lived in caves beneath the ground and blocked the mouths with neat skins let that question still abide for men who study ancient times to inform me if they will all i know is that now we had no blessings for the system if after all their cold and starving our weak cattle now should have to stand up to their knees in water it would be certain death to them and we had lost enough already to make us poor for a long time not to speak of our kind love for them and i do assure you i loved some horses and even some cows for that matter as if they had been my blood relations knowing as i did their virtues and some of these were lost to us and i could not bear to think of them Therefore, I worked hard all night to try and save the rest of them. End of chapter 45 Read by Landy in Sydney, Australia, October 2008